Hello there, you silly hemp nut. Welcome to the New Hemp Times podcast recorded at Gotham Studio, the sweetest smelling studio in the world. Woo! Yeah. All right. My name right. is Jay Hunt Marco. I've been researching cannabis for over a decade, and we are in the studio with Dr. Jan Roberts, licensed clinical social worker. Say hello. Hello, everybody. Hey, Doc. Hello. Also, uh, the unapologetic Hello. farmer, Randy Cameron Jr., actor, comedian. Everybody. Randy. What's and up? How we doing? We're great. We're good. Yeah. Well, today is July 17th, 2019, and we are continuing our ongoing coverage of the cannabis bonanza. Wow. And here to kick us off with the check-in, Dr. Roberts. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey guys, hey our fellow hemp nuts, hope you're doing great out there in the sweltering heat. We are here back with this little fun um, session, I guess, today of it's been so long since we've actually been together as a group and I feel so disconnected from my compadres. So I just wanted to kind of see how are we doing, what's going on in your hemp universe and, yeah. and what's what's up? What's up, Brandon? So it's been three weeks since, it, so it was, it's weird. We're getting back together. We and um, each other. I know, but we got a lot done and I uh, can't wait to tell our our supporters and folks and friends about what's going on. So you're um, feeling pretty good these days. Uh, I feel good physically. Good. A little peed off about the greenhouse <laughs> and who stomped on my damn greenhouse in Brooklyn. I'll be farmer. There's a farmer looking for somebody. But uh, <laughs> other than that, we're groovy. Wait, so let so let's tell people this is something that happens all the time. You all had equipment, and yep. someone broke in, stole stuff. What happened? Right. So I I don't want to say which one it was, but the lock was open <laughs> <laughs> in New York City. So Not you guys, smart. yeah, you guys could call it however you want to call it. Yeah. And um, I you know I haven't done a full inventory. We'll do that tomorrow mm -hmm. and see what's up. But uh. There's insurance on this stuff, so it'll be taken care of. So you always that. have that positive attitude. Got to. Things. I can't lose sleep over it. And you had a good vacation. You were good in the vacation. Cave. Good. Caught fish. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Farmer Jay Ran catches fish. Farmer Ran always catches fish. If, if you guys could see what he's wearing, he <laughs> always wears this cool necklace with a hook on it. So yeah. it's like I don't know if he's trying to like trap hey. people in his mm -hmm. necklace or what, or but it sounds like a good thing. Yeah. Cool. So, Jay Han, how are you, buddy? Oh, I think I finally recovered from that week in China. And wow. Touring and conferencing. Uh, that was, uh, that, that took a lot out of you. Going there was easy. It was quite an adrenaline rush being there. It was. Yeah. But coming back, I had like a thousand emails. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, yeah, it was insane. You know, a lot of it was probably spam. Um, and then just like catching up on work products. I mean, you come back from China where regulations are just beginning. And then here it's like we have the, the FDA testimony that finally mm -hmm. ended on July 16th. So it's just been kind of a busy time. So, and yeah. you, you submitted something to the FDA, right? Yes. Uh, on behalf of our institute, we submitted a public commentary um you know, providing the FDA some resources we think they should include and alerting them that, that like, hey, we're here, we're able to help. We've worked on committees that developed standards before. Mm -hmm. You know, we've provided advising on regulatory issues related to cannabis. Hey, you know, we're here to help and support you and make this happen as quickly as possible, yeah. uh, regulating hemp and CBD. Just for folks who don't know, when you say we're here. Oh, I'm talking about the International Research Center on Cannabis and Mental Health Thank and you. also, you know, all cannabis enthusiasts. Awesome. I think, I, think awesome. I should just have one big public committee. Yep. It's like every person who submitted comment, like all 4,000 or how many? It's like 3,500. Oh. You know, yeah. it's hard to tell. I checked at 10 and there was almost 4,000 submissions. Um, so, yeah, he wrote wow. a great piece. I, I wow, read it bro. last night and he did a fantastic job. Do you feel like you're kind of getting your body back on track after being away from China so much? Uh, you know, a little back? bit, a little bit. It, it's still sometimes I still wake up at three in the morning thinking I'm late for has it. your Mandarin improved <laughs> it, it has it has uh, I know it's like now I know the difference between Chinese hemp and just regular cannabis there's dahma which is regular cannabis and hanma which specifically refers to uh, Chinese hemp we were so excited about that and I know we'll talk about this in a little bit uh, a couple of words that we've talked about here on New Hemp Times we were able to use over there so it was kind of fun like Which, Hanma, you mean our slang like, words yeah. yeah the words you for the day you introduced the word to the well, day yeah, of course we funny. did to our fans that didn't realize what's going on you know, there might be some 
new yeah. folks chiming in and didn't realize that. Um, our heavyweights on the set on the team went to China last <laughs> week, in case you didn't hear on the street. Yeah. Dr. Jalen, Dr. Jahan had an amazing trip to China, and we're going to get into a little bit of details of it. Yeah. Um, to anybody did not realize that. So this is the aftermath and the recap <laughs> of our yes. adventures. The denouement uh, yeah. of it all. Exactly. Oh. But uh, Jan, how do you feel after oh, the trip? Louise. Uh, you know, you were kind of oh risking God. life and limb. You have that Tibet tattoo on your arm and you're going <laughs> to China. A little thug. Oh, with I, your know, thug I, wrist. I know. Yeah. I realized that. And I, I had to keep myself from yelling out words that I shouldn't. Um, I, I really had a hard time coming back. I My body let me down. <laughs> I thought it was just really bad jet lag, but I think um, we we I caught something either midair or as we were leaving Beijing, and I've, I've been sick, but I'm slowly out of the antibiotic phase. The fever's pretty much gone. Yesterday I had a low-grade fever, but I'm back. Did you really? Yeah. I Damn. missed you. I, I know. I got so sick at the office on Friday. Jeez. Both. Ron and Jayhan were just like, oh, my God, please leave. But um, but I'm back. You know, I I missed you guys. I'm it was such a shock. I think we were on adrenaline for some for so long when we were in China that the coming back was like a one two punch with your body getting used to the sleep and then getting sick. And just that whole like, oh, shit, we have so much to do kind of thing. It was a little scary, and I'm still trying to play catch up. Yeah, mm. well, because you didn't have, like, internet access there. You did, but you didn't. And you had to yeah. use VPNs, virtual private networks, and okay. turn them on. But sometimes they get overloaded or have to be reset, so you'd be like, oh, I have Google now. Oh, now I don't. Oh, I've got, you know, social media sites. Now I don't. And it's kind of a weird reality to live in where there's so much censorship and kind of like a different culture, different way of behaving. Like I was like, I'm not jaywalking here. You yeah. know? <laughs> it was I'm not even gonna spit or jaywalk. So we No I, cursing. I know we wanted to kind of talk about yeah. our trip and what we learned as it relates to hemp and China and international affairs. And I have to say I felt the spirit of my compadres here at New Hemp Times while we were there. You nice. know, Randy, yeah. I, I think that you you know, we met a lot of people, um, some from the U.S., some from other parts of the world, a lot from Asia, and just it was a mind-blowing experience. We were actually guests of the People's Republic of China, so they paid for us to come go there through um, this conference, and it was the largest hemp conference in China that's ever been held. It was standing room only. It, it was culturally such a different experience than anything I've ever experienced. So my compadres were guests of the government. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you see the People's Republic um, organized by Yeah, so when like, I went on a tour, they took some of us, he uh, had the option to go visit hemp farms and factories. And this northwest region of China, they've been cultivating hemp for you know, 10,000 years. So it's part of the culture there in a weird way. Um, but we had an official government delegation, so these little minivans with police cars, police diverting the road and like telling us where to go and stuff. It was, it was pretty wild. I'd never kind of been a part of that. You know, so in our van is like two people who used to work for the Canadian government. Um, some of the CEOs of the Chinese hemp companies, we visited like factories as well as like, you saw those pictures of the huge sprawling swaths and hectares. Of and we're going to post farm. those pictures because yeah. you, the, Folks, are you gonna? It's gonna blow your mind. I was you uh, standing yeah. under Someone. a hemp plant, yeah. like seven feet tall, it was. and the size of those. <laughs> so, so give me an estimation, and we'll set it up. I mean, we keep on saying we're gonna, but, but your visit to the hemp. Yeah, we're in the middle yeah. of it so, now. Yeah, that was part. <laughs> of How the big was that damn? I've never seen a, a a field of hemp that it looked like a forest of green that was. It was thousands of hectares. So, I mean, it was huge. It's hard to imagine it, but we're talking um, probably like almost like eight, maybe 10 football fields you're looking Easy. at. Yeah. Wait, can Easy. I, can I, I just say this, though, that we were in the northeast region of the country and it's known for farming. And so when we literally arrived into Harbin, we're, we're picked up by drivers, and on the way in, there's this huge billboard that bas basically says, welcome to the hemp capital of China, Harbin. So they're announcing this huge piece that they're so proud of the fact that they're growing hemp and what it can do for the country and for 
you know, the world at large. But what we found was that there was such a lack of information around hemp. You know, there was on the industrial side, I think they had talked a lot more about uses, but there were certain things that Jehan and I, we take for granted here in the States that we're having conversations around like the endocannabinoid system or the entourage effect that a lot of people didn't know about. So so the uh, that sign that you were saying yeah. that the town of, of Haben, Harbin. Harbin has, has uh, adopted this industry. Yeah. It's basically feeding the uh, industrial hemp fiber um, industry. Is that correct? Because there's oh yeah, they had uh, factories making all sorts of different planters and pallets mm-hmm. for construction mm-hmm. in buildings and gardening and things like that. They had the, the largest twine factory <laughs> yep. ever seen. Yep, um, it was a kind of amazing uh, the volume of hemp that they were going through um, and. And that's I was like, oh, man, it seems like they would process all the hemp in the world if they were operating 24 hours a day. And yeah. someone's like, well, this is the largest like in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they've got to be processing machines that aren't used here in the States because they've got lines of finished product that, as yeah. you said, pallets and used like to sell clothing and fiber still used in some of like in ships and things like that. And, and, China, you know, they they have it down. They've been doing it forever. I mean, yeah. they used to they used it in warfare for like their bows, yep. arrows. Mm-hmm. I thought of you and I, I found out that they used to use it for fishing, like yep. hemp fiber. Yes. They made fishing lines out of yeah. it because a lot of China started as states settled near large bodies of water. So yeah. hemp and fish are like. <laughs> exactly. And martial arts, which is another passion of ours. And, right. And, um, and also with the New York thing, while... Um, you know, I was like our, our missing compadre Greer, who's, you know, culturally entwined with, with Asian culture. And uh, I know he has plenty of questions. Oh. That he yeah, I brought a little pair of Bruce Lee shoes. Did you really? saw on the market. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah they were like made from awesome. a company like 200 years old, like right. the little black oh. top with the rubber bottom. Yes. We totally forgot to bring our little apothecary gifts. Oh, no, oh, I did brought you mine. Bring? Oh, oh, did you, oh you got a show. Oh, show yeah. A little show and tell. So no. first off, we were in, so we were in Beijing. Yeah. And you have to understand, we missed our flight um, out yeah. of Harbin to Beijing because, yeah. or they delayed it because there was, it was monsoon season. So Beijing airport actually closed down. I think there were 23 flights that had been delayed. So we missed yeah. our connector back to us. So we stayed in Beijing and Jehan and I, <laughs> I was like, Jehan, if we're going, if we're going to be second, here from to- four in the morning until yeah. eight at night waiting for our flight. We might as well go into the city. Is that how you did it? Yeah, yeah. of course. I drank like two like <laughs> frapp- Chinese frappuccinos and had some ginseng and, and I hit the town. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and so, well, we got, you know, I got a hotel, he got a hotel room. We stayed in this really nice area near the Forbidden City and we could just walk there. So... Our last day in China, we were in Beijing and touring, and his feet were killing him. We had no luggage because it was checked, and we had no clothes. So we were like, I know the night before, I was in the shower at like 3 a.m. washing my clothes because I I needed to have clean clothes. But his feet were hurting, so we went into this Chinese shoe store, and both of us got brand new pairs of Chinese shoes. And mine are so kick-ass. They're red and have dragons all over them. Are those the ones you wore at Uh, at the office? Are you laughing at a my Chinatown shoes? I've seen shoes? those in Chinatown. Well, I got them where they were made, in, damn it. Okay, so they're a little fresher. <laughs> and I had to try on like six pairs because they're handmade, so they like all fit differently. They weren't used to such a large foot. The left foot. felt a little different than the right one. Yeah. But they weren't used to, they were all handmade, supposedly. And they weren't uh, used to Jehan's feet. It was hard foot, to find shoes foot. that would fit it. I tried to buy like their knockoff version of Nike's, whatever company that is, or Adidas. You know, it's like, those are some wild shoes. A pair of those would be fun. And like they're like, oh, we, we don't make them that that size. It's like we stop at the size like ten or something. Are there American knockoffs in China? They they yeah. look yeah. Randy, they um, were so ugly. The shoes he almost bought. I'm so glad they didn't have his size. I didn't have the heart to tell you. <laughs> no, they were they were hideous. <laughs> I was like, they were comfortable. They look comfortable. And they were inexpensive. And I was like, wow, these are the ugliest sports <laughs> shoes I've ever seen. Ever they, seen. They're but kind I of amazing. Them, really? Damn it. But I, I want to see if I have them in my size. <laughs> But we had so many adventures. We really did. And 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 I think Jayhan and I kept like pinching ourselves like we are here because of cannabis. 
Holy yeah. cow. How lucky are we to have these experiences and meet the kind of people that we've met and and really forge relationships internationally that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And, and not a joint was smoked. No, no. no. Which we, is important because Yeah. Yeah. The well, you guys are pioneers and they're doing pioneer work. This is, you know, yes. talking about so, opening up industry, opening up yeah. Yeah. other. Um, and, and you're I, absolutely I, right. Yeah, it was the China International Hemp Industry and, Forum. And, and let's so get into a that a little bit because industry. that was like, yeah. that looked like Miss America pageant type <laughs> shit. I'm <laughs> like, well, what's up with the soundtrack on this? So and they had this huge the like LCD okay. and like LED light display. Uh, it was it was like really kind of magnificent and bright. Like it looked like a futuristic game show. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> and so in the very, very, very front row, you have all these big, huge like wing back chairs. Yeah, like, like laid, giant lazy boys for all the government officials. But they're like you know six foot high chairs, and there's people like sitting right behind that so. audience behind. Yeah, I can't <laughs> see them. And then you guys. So the st- just to paint it for the folks, I guess it's a a huge Conference. auditorium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The stage. It's- with Just a giant huge. screen. I mean, this is like yeah. an Olympic looking. The whole so, stage was a screen. Was a screen. I mean, like, it is a early Olympics. It, like, the first third of it was showing your face. So, a, a close up of your face, then were your slides, and then it was like who you were and where you represented. And when we made it to Harbin and made it to the hotel, and I saw the, the exhibit, it was, I know, I feel like this was so stupid for me to react this way, but seeing my name. And then Chinese around it was so like, wow, I, I really knew nothing about the language. I, I felt so completely out of place, but our hosts were so hospitable and so accommodating. And the first time we, we got in and we stayed at this hotel that was owned by the Chinese government. And well, it was, well, it is. Everything, so. is, Everything is owned yeah, by yeah, the yeah, Chinese yeah, government. Get down to it. And, um, but it was this beautiful, like my room had a friggin' tub in the middle. It was gorgeous. It was this gorgeous kind of suite that we were, in, that I was in, he was in, all of us were put up, all the rooms were like this. And we get there and immediately we hear a knock on the door and it's our host who's saying, hey, the uh, the head of the, the hemp program wants to meet you guys and to talk to you. And it was so interesting. We had to go meet him in the lobby and he and his entourage come in with a translator and we're sitting there on sofas, like, you know, sitting erectly, trying to be all proper. And they're talking, speaking to us in Chinese. And then the translators translating mm-hmm. to us. We answer them. The translator translates to him. And it was just like, holy shit. What now, are, give me know? an idea of oh what God. he would be, that, what his American counterpart resp- job responsibility oh. in the States. Who is this? Is this an FDA person? Is this so the, the uh, guy- what level? Um, so it's a little bit different in China when it comes to that sort of thing, but Mm -hmm. he was not a government official per se, but he interacts with a lot of them because he operates businesses. And so he definitely was in charge of making sure they got there and Mm. setting and running this conference. He was like Mm. the head of the hemp industry. Yeah, basically. Mm. And also running one of the largest hemp, um, operations in China as well Mm -hmm. and making products. And so he's making, they're making this big push to, allow them to diversify the types of hemp infused, basically almost CBD type products you'd expect. Right. And so they had a bunch of products that were on the demo tables and the, the little tables. That are on not on, in market and have... Well, they're in the market in the U.S. and other right. countries, but the they have these like inspection stickers on them for demo purposes. So they could be like, yes, CBD coffee, hemp infused coffee exists. Mm-hmm. This exists. This exists. So they had like a collection of all these products that they were saying, you know, we could make these here. Yeah. And uh, so it was kind of an eye-opening experience that they have the capacity to do this, but there's a very <laughs> clear gray area about what they'd be yeah. allowed to do. And they, and again, they would be making it to export to other places other that countries. have yes. Yes. And, usage. And They're was, not talking about usage within was, their own co- in their own country. That was, was one of their questions. Which is, was, gets yeah. me a little sketchy. How could we produce these products to meet standards in other markets? And it was so funny because if, People listen to our, um, while I was there, uh, Rick Trojan, who is, I guess he's the vice president of the Hemp Industry Association here in the U.S., he and I did a podcast together, kind of like a China for China kind of podcast. A China what? (laughs) 
But China, just, yeah, we'll look, we'll drop that. Oh, I won't. We got to pick up at halftime on that. But, okay. but China, it was like this little, anyway. Okay. So um, we did a podcast there, and he and I disagreed totally about pretty much everything. Is that right? Regulations, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, standards yeah. of training. It was, and because yeah. to me, I see this as an opportunity for China to do things right that the U.S. has screwed up on. And a lot of my presentation was around patient safety and making sure that they set this up in a way that as they're producing products, you know, they need to be mindful of Mm -hmm. the consumers and what that they're doing to make sure there's purity, that it's safe, that it's standardized, because a lot of those issues really aren't kind of being adhered to there. And we had an example where... We had a client who was using a product that was being exported from China. And we told our client, absolutely don't use this company because we can't find any safety sheets on this company. And come to find out, they were there at the conference and they loved my talk. Jan's That's what cracked me up. Doc was, Jan is badass. Dude. Just she like, goes to China and tells them, look, <laughs> safety needs to be premium with the shit you're producing. And I said, hello. It, and I said it to the guy who was there that it was the, his company his that company. we referred against. But, but the thing is, is that I loved his openness to it all. And that's really what this is all about is that okay. we're all trying to come together to do right by people. And they have an opportunity to learn from mistakes of other countries to try to do this the right way because they do have the potential of being the largest exporter of CBD sure. products and hemp products. And hopefully they'll do it the right way with regulations. And, you know, the cultural issue that we've been touching upon is, you know, they have a chance to, to learn from others' mistakes. And it's it's hard to imagine what this like is like because most of us, our cultures have been doing commerce for centuries. They just started doing commerce with other countries in the 1970s right that's when they start like i mean it's hard to imagine what that's like but it's imagine you know just you've never (laughs) done business on an international scale before and understanding um or even just sort of in a frank capitalist manner doing business it's a very different way of thinking offering can we chime in on that just a little bit sure all right make you you they have an opportunity to uh improve on mistakes that were made made in other uh, cultures or other countries. And clearly the elephant in the room is that it's a communist country uh, or or yeah. well, it's a communist country. Let's be government owned the government airline, owned the, airline <laughs> yeah. the, the hotel steel. you were in, the yeah. car that got you to the. Uh, but the hotel was uh, uh, rented to the university that rented it to the hotel company. OK, <laughs> so th- that was owned by the government. So there is a level. There is a small level of free enterprise yes, there that, a, that perhaps we as Americans didn't think existed there. Oh, I think absolutely. there's a lot. So chime, chime wait, in on that a little Randy, bit. Randy, I think there's a lot more industry private industry there than we thought. Right. So we kind I kind of came away thinking we had, and since this trip, we've had a lot of interest from companies from abroad interested in talking to us about certain types of products, et cetera. We found that this was really, I, I felt like it was more of a government sponsored, but private industry driven kind of conference. A lot of companies were trying to line up so that they could get ready for this boom. And and they saw their potential, but really kind of didn't know what to expect with CBD. So from my perspective, I, I have to say, I walked away feeling very differently about China than I did. It was never on my bucket list to go there, but I'm so grateful that I went. I walked away feeling like... Um, People were so incredibly hospitable. I still have questions about it. It's definitely a different culture, but I think that we've been sold a bill of goods here in the U.S. to think of them a certain way. And I think that they've been sold a bill of goods there to think of us in certain ways. And I came away feeling like we had so much more in common than we did not having it in common. And one of our goals, Jayhan and I have talked about, is that we are looking into having You know, when we set up the Research Institute, we set it up with the idea that it truly is an international research institute. And so we want to have partners all over the world, you know, and we want to have satellites all over the world so that we can do objective research around this. So let me ask you a cultivation question that just come to mind. Uh, 
American Pig Producers, China is one of their biggest purchasers Uh around the world. So thinking about this industry as uh, an exchange in China obviously has a huge head start on the volume of hemp that they produce, but they clearly are not uh, exporting and dealing in certain markets the way America is dealing in their market. Mm -hmm. As a up and coming uh, cultivator here and people that are carving out stakes in in the United States is competition something that we want being that we're playing catch up uh, how I, dominant well, how, are they a threat you know that's a good that's a good question it depends on what sort of threat you're thinking about um, there's a lot of innovative hemp technology especially when it comes to producing smaller amounts and higher qual- quality amounts they're just starting to experiment with growing plants for CBD now they can for whatever they lack in quality, they'll probably make up for it in volume. Yeah. You know and, that. And, but I think that as you know, the global village gets more connected, people are going to want to know the source and quality of these things. So I think they're going to definitely have to figure out how to adapt to these markets where the consumer is more educated. And I think we're going to find, you know, people yeah, are already starting to, Dr. Is yeah. I mean, you're seeing memes and a lot of articles now telling people don't, I'm not buying CBD at gas stations anymore. Exactly. I'm getting it through this place. And, exactly. and people are getting wise to the products that work and don't work or are not as advertised. So I think it's, it's one, it's, it's good for competition because there's a lot of room for innovation. You know, they were using techniques that are effective, but they're, you know, ancient. Right. (laughs) They're still plowing some hemp fields by hand and some use tractors and some don't. Some use a mix. I mean, what are they using to fertilize? um, That's a good question. What did it smell like? Well, one of the, we visited three in the delegation and one actually what we could see of it, because there are these little brick platforms you'd go with a big billboard and that's where the, they had these Bluetooth things where we were getting simultaneous translation while we were walking around. And some of the places had sand or almost like a kind of like a sandy clay spread around the bottom Mm -hmm. and a lot around like the first couple feet Mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of it was like kind of wet dirt. Some of it was wet sand. It didn't really seem like the best medium um, to grow hemp. I mean, it seemed like kind of like, you know, swampy. So there's plenty of water. Looks like nutrients. But again, it just seemed like uh, not the best one to grow flowering plants and but let, let's also say too i want to make sure that the listener understands that they are growing cbd they're growing hemp for primarily industrial use right now 100 percent. yeah yep and so they're not growing um plants that are high in thc it's mostly it's yep. cbd right you know thc is illegal there right and so it's not, you know, they're not trying to break into the American right. cannabis yeah. market. The they're, highest CBD producing plant, I think, in the conference that was presented, because everyone is like, I'm an agronomist, I grow hemp, this is what it tests at, because the government's all over THC production and keeping it down. You know, they're talking about plants that are producing between like 1 and 2% CBD. Sure. Like, yeah. and the, you sure. know. I mean, from observing the pictures that you showed me the other day, they were huge plants, some of the biggest fan leaves I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about it looked like five footers They're from like where I was. They bigger than his head. Yeah, they were huge. <laughs> um, yeah. They also had a ton of, uh, this is just my, yeah. you know, cultivating observation. They had a ton of white fly bites that seemed to me, you know, that you would expect in huge fields like that. Um, but I would also assume these old strains that are hardy and can take, medium quality soil, you know, they've, that reflects in that, uh, you know, different than some of the uh, more boutique plants that we see here that probably wouldn't yeah. sustain that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's that environment that, you know, some of the indoor genetics, they've been cultivated to grow under very specific conditions. Right. So, right. I don't, I don't know if they'd have the capacity for that type of intense technical so. labor. Yeah. 
Because yeah, it's, it's it, just brute force there. It is. Yeah. Like, it grow is. as much hemp as possible, line yep. people up, and yep. just, yeah. Well, I have to say, though, I think it's the beginning of this. They realized that there was a lot of knowledge that they were lacking and were interested in doing this. We actually saw something that was pretty fantastic. In fact, it was released in the news. Oregon State University did the news release about the hemp research in oh, China. Yeah. We were there for so the we signing. So we were there for the official signing, and it was like this huge moment. Um, rewind that. Uh, what is There it? was on stage at this at this um, conference, at mm-hmm. the beginning of it, was a signing between the head of Oregon State University's, mm-hmm. uh, one of their departments that are, are producing hemp, with um, this association, this in- industry association, to kind of do more research together. So they literally had a ceremony, a signing ceremony with music in the background, you know, these women coming up, giving them these official documents that were signed in front of the entire crowd. And it was like this big achievement that China felt. Really? And, and that's some of the stuff that we noticed that there was so much like pomp and circumstance around like. Just what? these wonderful kind of like So what is going to be, I know so they're, what they're is going to be So they're creating a collaborative then... research thing. I, I think they were looking towards Oregon State to really help them kind of make sure that their production is doing better and that they're growing and that they're being able to use this from an industrial perspective as, as well as they can. Improve on, un- on their improve current their industry crops. with yep. what Oregon State's yep. research is yep. Plan for okay. the economic impacts of yep. like a new industry Extension. emerging, then yep. crashing, and, and so the government. Out. I mean, right. obviously, then the government understands <laughs> that this is an opportunity here for them. You know, this is one of the most populous countries in the world, and so if they can help this with fiber, if they can help this with uh, construction, these are huge op- opportunities for them to begin the beginning of that. And, um, and so the medication aspect of it all was almost like not secondary, but it was just one piece of the pie to a larger picture of the impact of hemp. And, and it was fantastic that we had, um, Chris, gosh, I'm going to forget it. Is it Conrad? Yeah. Yeah, Chris Chris Conrad Conrad was there. And who was that? He is friggin' awesome. You want to tell him about? So Chris Conrad is one of like, the longtime original cannabis activist. He, he teaches now at Oaksterdam University. He's one of the court qualified uh, cannabis experts. He helped to create. He's an attorney, uh, right? Uh, no, no, he's no. a court qualified cannabis okay. expert. He works with a lot of attorneys, attorneys. and knows okay. the law very well. But he's a uh, also an author. He's author, authored a couple books, including his most famous one, "Cannabis Yields and Dosage," which was like the book on. Uh, crop production used both by people in the industry and by law enforcement and even physicians until like the you know maybe just 10 years ago i mean it was used for decades as a very influential but important document he, this guy actually he and his friends in the 70s were responsible for kind of bringing into the consciousness of the u.s about hemp they yeah. were literally part of that original grassroots movement of dude have you heard of him you know, you can use this for fabric. You can use this for, you know, um, backpack shirts. Are you saying he was paid to? to no, he he was he, just, he was he was at his natural passion. This is yeah, what he, is this. Passion. and he was he was decades. incredible. He hmm. was fantastic. And and what I found was that there was such a respect, you know, for us as Americans. I really wanted to show respect to their culture, you know, and and I think we've had so much propaganda on both sides mm-hmm. about you know, who Chinese people are and who Americans are. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of walked away from this whole conference feeling like I had more hope in humanity. Believe It might have been the fact that there wasn't a lot of Trump news going on yeah. around me, too. Yeah, but, do it. But, but I will tell you, you know, that people really wanted to do right. So like the head of the hemp industry forum, he was so cute. He was very serious. But one night we saw him after he had had a little bit too much to drink and he was so kind of cute about that and he was just like welcoming all of us you know with open arms it, it was just such a unique beautiful experience and right the food amazing shit we haven't told you about the food all right so before we go because <laughs> i want to hear about that's something we could appreciate coming from new york yeah. we love our our uh our chinese food do you know they don't call it chinese food what do they call it soul food they just call it food <laughs> just food <laughs> Randy, Good you food. have to know that. 
that. I really can't. I swear. Dude. I had the best. It's damn soul food. I had the best potatoes ever in China. Well, we were in Harbin. Yeah, those the, potatoes. Oh, uh, right. like, oh my god! I mean, they're huge potatoes. McDonald's uses their potatoes. That's crazy. They make up seventy percent of the frozen potato market. Oh my world. god! But scary. these potatoes, we had hot pot. We haven't even talked about Chairman Gals. Yeah. His uh, but whole Randy, adventure. you had something you wanted to hit on? You- yeah, I was. Oh well. So again, we have perceptions about. China and yeah. um, some being true, some being not true. Right. One of our perceptions is the freedom that we perceive we have in America and that they may not have that in China. Mm-hmm. Um, we do know for a fact that they don't have the same drug problems that we're facing here in the States, or we assume that they don't. Right. Um, uh, was there any observation well, or first off, any we knew not to take anything not to try <laughs> anything i didn't want to be in Bush a labor nine. camp right. you know but but i will say the alcohol was difficult to come by mm. we went to a bar at the hotel that literally had no alcohol one they, night. Had the, they had three <laughs> bottles of spirits what yeah wow. and like they're like this is a bar i'm like really <laughs> it's like they're like why what does a bar look like in america it's like well usually there's glasses <laughs> so what were they it was a water bar eh, they no, eventually I mean, found a, stuff but yeah, I, my he didn't friend, even know how to open the anything I my mean, friend, wait this funny. is so funny this is a story a true story so my friend um they didn't have any alcohol so we found out that you could order room service to get alcohol even though the bar didn't have alcohol so my friend rick ordered all of this alcohol for his room and then he said by the way I'm on the 42nd floor, which is the lobby. He's like, instead of delivering it to my room, deliver it to me in the lobby. <laughs> and that's how we had alcohol for the night was oh, they really? brought a they whole did. like case of wine and beers. But we they didn't even want to do it. And he had to keep doing, you know, telling them, no, I'm ordering room service. I need you to deliver it here. You know, and, and, this and is that's to, how uh, he's we had talking it. to a liquor store. No, no he's talking to, to the room hotel service hotel because who is then. Getting it from well, the bar didn't, didn't have, have it at the at hotel. The bar, so where's their so stash? We had to call room service to get it delivered, and we were all still sitting in the bar. I see. <laughs> so I there were see. a lot. Of, so this was what I learned about China. And Jay Han, I forgot the exact quote, but you summed it up beautifully. Because um, oh, it's to, a it's a nation of laws, not a lawful nation. <laughs> right, because like the VPN. Everybody uses a VPN. They know they use the VPN. Some hotels have a VPN yeah. for you. To for use. those who don't know yeah. what yeah. VPN it's virtual, is. So it's a like, virtual private network. To make it look like you're connecting to, to the internet in so you, you know New York instead of in China. And so, so you get unblocked from everything. So you can see, you can go on Facebook. You can go check on your Instagram. Email. You, can check your Amer- email. you can look at American you can go porn. Go- Google. Amen. You know. Amen. Oh my God. Excuse me. <laughs> Oh, the latest Chinese couldn't even issue. get Pinterest over there, right? <laughs> so, so, but, but that's the thing, though, Randy, is that everyone knows that they do it. It's almost right. like the government knows that they. I mean, there's no way that they can regulate all of these of people. And so, those were some of the lessons I kind of walked away with. Is that you know, people were just genuinely kind. They loved to host you. They wanted you to feel welcome. It was a little creepy. Mm-hmm. In the sense, like we had a tour the last day we were in Harbin, and, and, and the reason I used the word creepy was because I didn't know kind of how to interpret it. We get off this van that was we were picked up at the hotel, taken to this compound. We get out of the van, and there are like six people standing there in their lab coats welcoming us into this research compound, speak, giving us this presentation all in Chinese. And we had a translator, thankfully. But... It, it was like all brand new equipment. It was shiny. Everything was perfect, but you just didn't see a lot of people there. So you mm. didn't know what had it been used, had it not been used. It, it was just, it was a very different experience. A different experience. I keep thinking, Jay, uh, the historical usage of herbal medicine in China and Africa, I mean, goes back the the oldest, you know, and I can't wait to see what they do with, you know, <laughs> with... <laughs> With, I can't wait to see what well, I'm having. They've been doing flashback. 
They've been doing so much <laughs> stuff we might find weird with plants. Right. That's just like normal what I thing. just did. So we, the, I had to visit an apothecary. I mean, it had these giant crickets outside. It was very, like, mystic 1980s gremlin film. I mean, it was totally weird. It was all clean and stuff, but it was, like, really kind of a trip. And they had this really old ancient artwork of people consuming herbs all these different ways. And yeah. one of the ways was them, like, grinding them up and yeah. snuffing them. And yeah. it was just, like... Wow, so that's how you take ginseng. Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. why we went to that apothecary, and Jay Han and I were so, we were like, it took us a while to realize what it was, and there were these beautiful, beautiful glass painted, like, um, almost like perfume, perfume contained. Perfume bottles, but yeah. they have spoons in them. And so you Never treat seen that you, <laughs> yeah. So you, you so, so you could of course put it in a tea or something like that. But, but like no. literally, this was like a this was her specialty, and she had all these recipes of you know non uh, drug plants in a sense. But you know, it's like that here's you some can lavender, inhale and sniff. There were so basically, this was herbal um, kind of like supplements. So and it was funny, Jayhan and I like picked the same one that we wanted. So we got it, and she. We bought stuff. I bought two different kinds of stuff, and you—it's basically Chinese herbs that you snort up your nose, and it feels like I'm snorting like um, the real shit. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Not Mom, a cat. No. I've only heard. No, no it's—I feel like I'm snorting my Chinese ca- like, or like my kitchen you, cabinet because you. it's like ginseng and shit to birds. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Bay she leaf. was just messing with us. She's like, "This is a foot powder." I'm gonna... <laughs> She's like, "Silly Americans, they won't know." <laughs> so of course, Jay and are like, "We've got to try this." <laughs> <laughs> for science and cultural, like so, we learning. brought some back to you and Greer. Uh, oh, we have I'll save like, it for it, Greer. He's it, Mikey. <laughs> Mikey. He likes it. it. He, he likes, likes it. it. He li- he'll do anything. Um, but it's the funniest thing. Like Jay, I'll take is, a smell at least. Just oh oh yeah, take a up. smell. It burns because I just I tried don't trust it. You. But it, oh my god, it was so it's, funny. We tried it, and we're walking along Beijing. Like, like we've got it. We've got plenty of energy. Maybe this is why I got sick. But <laughs> yeah. you'll but know in the morning. But you know what? Though he didn't get it. He didn't get sick. So I don't think it's. I that. don't know whether to eat it or cook with it or. I, know. You know, I mean, it's like I could make some really good lamb with this. I feel like too. It smells like <laughs> ginger gong, the tonic that that the. Uh, oh yeah. You know the West Indian guy. Yeah. We, we up to, it smells just like that. It's just so amazing. Like, here's this whole culture that for thousands of years have had its own medicine. It's had its own um, kind. In fact, that whole area is where hemp and cannabis came from, you know, except from Tibet. I'm Mm -hmm. really honest about it. Yeah, and they (laughs) used it for everything. So, like, not only in traditional clothing and building, um, but also even in their lacquerware, like dishware used to be made from hemp. Like some of the, like the fine china and stuff, the early versions of that the pre- were like pressed hemp covered in lacquers mm. or, or different seed which, oils. Which could very much become relevant here yeah. again. So with our time constraint, just each of you give me one parting either story or experience or what we can look forward to or something that we sh- about the sum up of this, this, the trip that you just had. Oh, well, I would like to give a shout out to the speaker I saw, Philip Gu. He's the CEO of a company and he was full of ideas about the future. And he most reminded me of a, an American of like going to a regular US cannabis or hemp business conference. Cause he got up there and he's like talking about the history of cannabis. And he's like, it's a millions of years old plant. You know, the dinosaurs ate hemp. <laughs> and then he also said that the first plant to be cultivated by humans on Mars will be hemp. Um, and he had a, was he high? He was talking some shit, huh? He was just. I was impressed. impressed. He woke me up. Good. I mean, yeah. So Good. I thought that was like, so for every like very structured, rigid and agronomist style a business person that was there presenting. There was also the, the occasional futurist. Yes. Not afraid to express himself. himself. And, and I, hopefully he is not in a prison someplace <laughs> <laughs> right now. Doc Chan. Oh, my God. You know, I have to say that was such... I, I'm even going to call it a vacation just because it was so different than anything I had ever experienced. 
I felt so humbled that we had an opportunity to make a difference in a country that's such a huge populous country Word. to really kind of talk about issues related to patient safety, issues related to the endocannabinoid system and how yeah. cannabinoids can be used to help other people. And I felt like we had this opportunity really to kind of drive the reason why Jayhan and I are in this business to begin with, and you too, Randy, you know, is to really kind of educate. And I just felt so honored that we had that opportunity. But, um, but I will say that I'm going to, I'm going to say this, my colleague kicked ass over there. He really, he kicked ass. He took names. He was just fantastic. And it was the funniest thing to see him do this speech because everyone was kind of monotone and he was yep. like, bam, bam, bam. Hitting them. And then afterwards, like his little row of uh, fans afterwards wanting to give him his card. And and it was I so cool. It. Dr. J hit him with the tiger. <laughs> he style. did. He did. I he was it. totally kung fuing them. <laughs> yes. And it was the coolest thing. When you give a card, you do it with two hands and you accept it graciously mm. and you bow. And I loved the formality mm. of that. I, I really loved how they were really respectful and as a female and if you know anything about the area you know china has issues with human rights and for women especially they often don't have rights and are overlooked and being like one of the few females presenting there and as a clinician i just felt so honored to have Good. that opportunity let me ask you this part and quick question um and we'll post this picture on our site that table that had the rotating food, what was the best dish that you guys, so, so just to set it up for you folks, the table must have been like nine feet in circumference. And <laughs> there was a guy in the middle of it that were putting dishes up and it rotated and all the folks sitting around were able incredible. to just take what they wanted. So food was Dr. J, the best dish on that. It would, um, gosh, it have to, there's a tie, but I would say that the edges out to these, um, I, I guess they're like lamb shanks and lamb ribs. They just had this mm. huge pile of them, mm. and they were so delicately cooked, and it was just like you could just grab one and the meat fell off the bone. Right. Are was, those the ones that you uh, kept going back for? Yeah, oh, there was like God. I was like a Neanderthal. Like I'm a like, Jay Hun, go get bones. more. Jay Hun, go get more. Right. Well, and also, this is something, Jay Hun, before we left, Dr. Marcus sent this to me like, hey, we might need to bring extra toilet paper. And he's like, that's bullshit. Right. My God, it's trying to throw up. No, you need to have extra toilet paper because some places exactly. don't have toilet paper. and They don't supply it. So and as a woman, you know, we're used to sitting on something. Sometimes it's just a hole in the toilet. ground and you just watch. Right. And so it, it was really a great kind of experience. But to me, the potatoes were those were the best. Those and those ribs, the garlic ribs. I, nice. I came back when I came back from China. I went to Chinatown here in the city and looking tried for. It. I did, and I got yeah. some. They weren't as good, but they were close. Yeah, and rice wasn't served with a single yeah. dish. Right. Oh God, hey, the, the real thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hi. Awesome. All right. All right, my New Hemp Times folks. That was outstanding that was adventure it, back from China. We're so glad to be back. We missed good. you guys. Good, good, good. All right. Well, thanks for listening. And we'll be back uh, in probably in a few days with another episode. Stay tuned.